Hello and welcome. You are listening to The Day My Brain Broke, presented by me, Lucy Reddin, in partnership with the Encephalitis Society. We shall be sharing with you the lives and experiences of those affected by encephalitis, a type of brain inflammation. Hello there and welcome to another podcast and YouTube video. Today we are speaking with the wonderful Tom Cox. His wife, Tony, will be joining us later, but I just wanted you to formally be introduced to Tom first. Tom and Tony are both hailed from Oxfordshire. So, hi there, Tom. How are you today? Very well, thank you. Good, good, how good. So lovely to see you thank and you. to speak with you today. So... Really, it was just to hear your version of events and how things have, you know, progressed for you through your journey of having had encephalitis. So, first of all, if you wouldn't mind um, telling us, the audience, what your life was like before you were actually diagnosed with encephalitis. Um, Well, I was a tree surgeon, um, seven days a week, pretty much. I worked all the time <laughs> that so uh, Tony's probably I mean, I don't work that much anymore because it was constant it was all the time it was relentless really um but yeah I, that's it I know I worked a lot I played darts I just went out with my friends a lot we holidayed quite a bit um yeah you know just the normal day-to-day life really yeah 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 just that you know Living life, doing what we all do. Exactly <laughs> that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So then um, with the case of most of us have a bit of a run up into, you know, kind of like how, it, how we were feeling before we were kind of like eventually hospitalised. Was the run up for you, um, was it a matter of days, a matter of weeks or a matter of months that you were kind of feeling slightly unwell? How was it for um, you? No, we had no idea. It was literally in one day I was hospitalised. I was at work and within a couple of hours I was taken to the hospital by Tony. Um, uh, Yeah, I lost my memory at work. It it was like it was going every five seconds or so. I just couldn't remember what I was doing or where I was. Um, So I ended up going home. Um, and Tony took me to the hospital and then they said about getting a neurologist and that was it I didn't come out for a little while yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. So and that I must don't remember been, a lot from then yeah such a scary experience for it literally to happen that quickly just yeah. over the course of one day so was it a case of almost you were just continuously repeating yourself and not being Absolutely. able to remember that, that was exactly it I was trying to do the same thing up up the tree, asking the same question over and over again. And they just didn't, they thought it was a bit strange. So they asked me to come down. So I got down and um, yeah, that was was it. And I guess in that job role, that's a pretty scary thing with all the machinery and things like that that you use. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so I haven't been back to work since I don't think I've, well not that I can remember anyway so yeah, my memory is yeah. very cloudy yeah sure okay so then in that case the day your brain broke you were taken to hospital when was this what time frame are we talking about um I think we we spoke about it the only the other day actually me and Tane and a little bit over the last few days actually I think 2012 I think it we said Tom said it happened yeah um yeah I can't I'm I'm terrible at remembering uh, things like that especially when it comes to numbers and dates and stuff like that I'm terrible absolutely terrible it happens yeah. to the best of us don't worry Tom I completely identify <laughs> with you I think um there's certain areas of the brain that get affected by specific types of encephalitis. Do you know what type of encephalitis you were diagnosed with? Um, Are you all, uh, I have temporal lobe seizures. That's all I know. So I can't actually remember what type it actually is. Um, 
yeah so that's all I, that's all i can tell you is the type of seizures that i suffer with that's that's about it really so the seizures you have and then there's obviously the short-term memory that you were struggling with the yes. having to recall names and numbers yeah. Yeah, I'm fine with who people are, faces and things like that, but um, anything short term, that I, no good with that at all. There's no short term memory whatsoever. Yeah, it's it's shocking, really. Bless you. Yeah, <laughs> and are you finding new ways to deal with that? Ways to cope with that? To get around that? Yeah, there's a lot of um, sort of reminders and prompts around the house, and we've just got a Google which is quite amusing <laughs> with uh, alarms. So I, to remind me to take tablets and things like that um, and yeah, and help get the kids or pick them up from school, or help get them ready for school. So that's quite amusing. But um, yeah, it's, um, it's, it's, it's strange. It's hard as well. You know, it's quite, it's almost quite, it pushes down, it pushes on a little bit being reminded by a piece of technology. It's, it's not, you know, rather than just your brain. It's it's a bit weird sometimes. It could be, I guess, because it's not something that, we you know, we were brought up using. It's kind of like a new piece, like you say, a new piece of technology. Exactly. But then I guess for, well, I'm presuming here, but maybe like with your children, for example, I see a lot of children now, the technology that they're growing up with, to them, it's just something that's seen as, as normal, as just part of their yeah. everyday life. Yeah, I mean, they can use it better than I can. <laughs> They're amazing with it, bless them. Yeah. Yeah. Bless I them. Admit, it might be something I may need to invest in because I'm still at the moment, I have post-it notes stuck everywhere or just posters in my, in my flat oh, to well, remind me of things. Yeah, we've still got those going around everywhere at the moment. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely something that's hard, I think, for people out there, if they're listening, who haven't experienced encephalitis or know anybody with it, the adjustment that it takes, the way that it can completely change the direction of your life. I mean, are you able to give us a little bit more insight about that? So, for example, you said you no longer are working. So yeah, how no. has you? Uh, well, I'm more of a, of a house husband, really. I just... I don't work anymore. I sort of stay at home. I potter into town, get a bit of shopping and things every now and then. Um, Tony works. She's backwards and forwards from work. Um, does quite a lot from home as well, bless her. Um, so I'm just sort of backwards and forwards, really, just pottering around. Don't, yeah. Don't do a great lot, a great deal, sorry. No, do no. Quite a bit of walking we do together and stuff like that. But, you know, that's, that's it, really. So how have you found in that case with that complete change of, you know, kind of like roles for the two of you, for both you and Tony, what's your kind of like more external network being like, you know, friends and family? Have they been able to offer you much support? Uh, that's changed quite a bit because I don't go out. I don't really see many friends anymore. Uh, I've been a few of my friends, they've changed job role themselves, so they're busy doing their own things anyway. Um, but they're, I don't go out and play darts or anything anymore, so I don't go out in the evenings really anymore. Mm. Um, yeah, just don't do a lot really, but I do have the children as well, so we, we, have, a, we have really good fun. We good. do have good fun, bless them, you know, they're great, they're great fun. And we, I mean, obviously we want to protect privacy and things like that regarding children, but, you know, how old are they? How, how have they been able to adapt and change regarding um, your changes? They are, Ava, Ava is seven, Erin is six or five. Um, but they're, they're brilliant. They are absolutely fantastic, bless them. They're really, you know, they just adapt and because they've sort of, grown up with it they just adapted to it so well they really have they're really really good girls bless them yeah yeah and to you I mean to them you're just dad so that's that's how it is isn't it so Absolutely. they must yeah. just be 
overjoyed that they've just got access to you almost, you know, full time access, time. permanent yeah, access. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> yeah. What could two little girls too much. They yeah. really need to go off to work all the time. So I go <laughs> away for a bit. <laughs> Having the children, having, you know, your two girls, Ava and Erin, in your life must bring such positivity and such yes. happiness. So they must be so important to you in order to yes. feel that you've got still a fulfilling, you know, yes. kind of like oh, life. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, hugely. Yeah. They really do. They 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 are they're they're a massive part of it. They make it worthwhile. So does Tony. Absolutely. She's been a, a humongous part of it the whole rehabilitation part of everything so they, they all three of them have been fantastic Perfect. They really have. They've Perfect. Helped so much well on that note shall we bring tony in shall we yeah. introduce her <laughs> probably best <laughs> thank you <laughs> so here we have tony welcome tony thank you for joining us how are you yeah well, i'm good thank you thank you for having us for having me thank you not at all <laughs> very pleased to have you so we've just been listening to tom tom's very kindly and very openly shared you know how encephalitis has affected him and i just wanted to kind of backtrack a little just to get your side of things just as you're now becoming you've become tom's carer um so it was just to understand for our audience, for the benefit of our audience, what it's like now, how things have changed, because we've heard from Tom's perspective, obviously kind of like roles have, have changed. Tom was working, he's now not working anymore. You're going out to work, there's, you know, managing of the children, that type of thing. Um, if we can just go back to when Tom was first diagnosed with encephalitis back at the hospital. Do you, because quite, I'm quite often, I think just about everybody I've spoken to who had encephalitis does not remember anything that happened. We all need to rely on our loved ones to tell yeah. us what happened in hospital, to be perfectly honest. So Tom, you're not on your own there, that's for sure. <laughs> so um, yeah, Tony, are you able just to you know give us a reminder, if you don't mind, just how things were? Because it sounded absolutely just frightful, to be honest. Like one day he's at work, and then you know within a couple of hours you're then both in hospital. Are you able to just yeah. tell us a little bit more? So it was it was actually just a little bit longer than that. So it comes a hundred percent right. He literally he, it was like he woke up one morning and had no memory, and it was five seconds. He's gone off to work. He's come back, and we've taken him down to the GP. And um, the GP said Tom's got global amnesia. Given 48 hours after the weekend, you know, a few days, he'll be absolutely fine. few days did not leave Tom's sight. It was every five seconds, um, not retaining anything, not knowing anything, massive confusion. You feel in a bit of a sticky point because you think, okay, we're waiting for this global amnesia. You're Googling global amnesia. You don't have a clue what that is. Well, no, that's a thing. Um, we went back to the GP and the GP said, I'm going to call a neurologist. Um, you'll have to wait about 10 days or so and I'll get back to you. Um, so I reluctantly <laughs> thanked him for all of his help. And that was lovely that I was going straight to hospital with Tom, um, which he did. In all fairness, he did ask me not to do. He did ask me to be patient. Um, I'm not great at being patient. So uh, <laughs> off we went to A&E and uh, Tom had some blood tests and lovely neurologist came down later on that afternoon um apologized to us that we'd waited so long um and said very weirdly i'm going to send you home please pack a bag because when you come back tomorrow there will be a room ready for you both and you won't be going out for a, we need some serious investigation so it was at that moment i knew i knew it was serious because something wasn't right i thought we'd pop to hospital and that would be okay and I, it was go and get both of your things Tony you're staying as well he can't be left on his own and off back we went the next day and uh, were there for pretty much most of December we had a pre um like a test session for a couple of hours to see if we could bring Tom home at Christmas mm -hmm. um so we brought Tom home on Christmas day and I think we went back on the 27th possibly I think we fighted for a couple of days um off and change of scenery but yeah that was the initial 
the initial part. Wow. Um, and what year did this take place, Tony? It was December 2012. It was 2012. Yeah, oh, so we got married in the April. We'd been married for about six months and then, um, oh. then it happened, yeah. Wow. Oh, you guys are amazing. <laughs> we have a little joke. We say that in the sickness and health part, Tom's really putting a claim in there. And, uh, Pushing it a little bit, right? <laughs> he's made his claim. He's, yeah, he's uh, doing that, but yeah. Oh, goodness me. And so you then hear encephalitis. Yeah. What are your thoughts? What on earth is that? What is going on? We got taken into a, so it was five days in hospital before a diagnosis. Lumbar punctures, MRI, CT scan, PET scan, you name it. Tom, bless him, endured it. Um, we then went down for an ultrasound. Um, Tom had an ultrasound and the... Um, doctor said I'm just going to get a second opinion the mm. second opinion came and then with the second opinion I said what on earth is going on and they said we found a tumor so we went back up to the wards I got Tom settled in his room luckily Tom couldn't remember that it was still five seconds so for Tom it was fine I'm stomping up the corridor I need to see a doctor so the doctor <laughs> was very sad um, that that's how we got told but it was fine it wasn't a problem so Tom actually has, um, I think it's called MAR2 or MA2 um, encephalitis. And that is basically when it's related to like a, a tumour. So we had cancer, the cancer had spread. And rather than the antibodies attacking the cancer, they attacked a healthy part of his body, which was his brain. But we live, I live anyway, and I think Tom is with this. If Tom didn't get encephalitis, his cancer would have been undetectable and he wouldn't be here today. Wow. So you live with, I'm grateful for encephalitis versus I really don't like this encephalitis. And you just have to really sometimes dig really deep, don't yeah, you, to kind of absolutely. find the courage to say, no, come on, this with or without encephalitis. But like the encephalitis has saved Tom's life. That is really pushing. I have a mantra like everything for a reason. And that mm. that is that right there, really, isn't it? But it's still... Yeah such tough you know kind of like mm. each odd is you know e each end yeah. of that is still both really really tough so you have both been through an incredible lot and um I hadn't even heard of that type of encephalitis before so that's just opened up my eyes to just there's still so many different versions out there different you know strains of it so again thank you again for just highlighting that because that again is something that people I'm sure just will not know about. Yeah. Um, so then you, you're then left with this diagnosis. How long um, was Tom in hospital for? Like, how, was it weeks, months? So he did, I would say really, he did a, a very good steady month. He then came home for a few days and then they started his cancer treatment in the January. But because of the encephalitis, he wasn't allowed to do the beginning part of that as a... Um, an outpatient he had to do that as an inpatient mm -hmm. so um and again he couldn't be left on his own so we rocked up and um hotel churchill as we call it we've had a few hotels no complaints everything service has always been we're five starring any hospital that tom has been checked into and kindly taken me along um to churchill um and then you were out so probably about six weeks and then as over the years there's been a few relapses and things like that so tom um go but he might pop back into hospital for a week or something like that but touch wood at the minute it's all nice and steady and we haven't had any trip advisor reviews to do have we no oh who's this oh this is the gear <laughs> she's an absolute menace <laughs> There's something about cats, and um, for those listening to the audio version, we've just had a cat that's <laughs> just come onto the screen, <laughs> which I think they always just seem to be able to just kind of like sniff them out, don't they? They just appear. <laughs> I've not done a work Zoom yet without a tail or something going across. Screen. Exactly that. Yeah. Exactly that. We actually have two cats, and we have them from the neurologist's um, recommendation. So when Tom first came out of hospital, he was asked to um, get an animal. Couldn't have a dog because he couldn't be left on his own. But a goldfish wasn't substantial enough, apparently. So we went, um, they said, how about a cat? So it was to help Tom with training the brain and remembering. So that became 
solely his responsibility to feed the cats and look after the cats and do everything with the cats. And how have you found that, Tom? Uh, yeah, it was, it's, um, well, they've been tricky, <laughs> should I say. <laughs> but, uh, it's been all right remembering to look after them. Yeah. They've just, um, yeah, been menaces. We sadly, <laughs> we lost the original cat. Yeah. That was, that we... We had she um went for an operation at the vets and she was allergic to the anesthetic so because oh. of that she ended up with brain damage and epilepsy so you can't write these stories so yeah she's um she had some brain damage so she had a acquired brain injury should we say and she had epilepsy um, but sadly if that happens early on when they get a bit older they can it can cause problem with the heart so sadly we lost her but the need for tom's need like brain wise we um you know, we thought we still need to carry on with that. So we got Tom two cats, double the trouble, and they're kittens. So they're definitely, they're keeping Tom on his toes. the other one hasn't come to visit the screen. Yeah. We will give it time, Tom. You never know. There's still time. <laughs> <laughs> I think once they know they're being spoken about, they'll come in and make an appearance. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, Tony, we were talking earlier just about, you know, the massive, massive adjustment to Tom not being able to work um, anymore. How, from a carer's point of view, if you're able to, obviously, I'm not trying to put the hat on and you speak for all carers, but from your point of view, how, how were you able to adjust to that change and what adjustments did you have to make? Yeah, it was really, it was really tricky because, one, you've got Tom's... Um, frustration of knowing that he's not a tree surgeon now so you're there with somebody Tom didn't need Tom got to the point where he didn't then need a care caring for all the time so I could kind of leave Tom in and out um, but as time's gone on and more seizures and different relapses so we kind of built up to a really good point and then unfortunately kind of deteriorated again so now I am Tom's Tom's carer um, and it is a massive adjustment because you go from somebody who's so physically and mentally able to all of a sudden that's gone and they've got their own rightfully so um, frustrations and worries but then you have that too because you're you're used to seeing somebody do that do them and all of a sudden they don't know who they are anymore your relationship changes your marriage changes so and then you kind of become a bit more dependable and I became very um to be honest I probably still am I'm going to say possessive, but that sounds very bad. It's not possessive, protective. Yeah. Because when you then support somebody so much, now I find myself very, not in a mothering role, it's completely different from the children, but I just find when you've gone through something like that so close together and your role is to start, I, for such a long time, I was Tom's voice and I knew. And so now you kind of, that you've got to adapt that in your marriage as well. Mm. Um, I was working full time, but again, I've, I don't work full time anymore. So I've changed my kind of career. Um, I now work two mornings a week, three hours, but then I can come home and I can work from home so I can be mm. with Tom mm. um, and be around if he's unwell. So, yeah, there's a lot of adaptation and a lot of emotion that goes with that, positive and negative. Um, yeah, it's a definitely a, it's a roller coaster for sure. I bet it is. Yeah, definitely. And the wider network of friends and family, how has their adjustment been with regards to the encephalitis diagnosis and seeing the changes in both your relationship and you know your roles? Yeah, they've been really supportive. Both families are really supportive. Um, we're both very lucky for that. They're local, which is really, we're really blessed for that. When Tom was in hospital and when he came out because he couldn't be on his own, we definitely had people would come and they would sit with Tom so I could go and shop by myself or, um, you know, I could have a shower so Tom could have something else to look at other than me. Um, so they've been really supportive in hospital. They always brought meals on wheels and, you know, thing, things like that. Um, yeah. Now the practical help isn't so much, but that's probably because we've got in a routine of knowing what we need now and how it is. Um, and Tom, you know, can be on his own for periods of time. Um, but certainly they're definitely there. If you want to pick up the phone and speak to them, they help with the children. Um, so we've been very blessed with that, yeah. haven't we? Financially at the start, because you go into hospital, you both don't work. There's no 
you know, there's that. So financially, both parents helped and that was massive. Um, yeah, they just they just worked on that together. My mum took the reins on it, went to Tom's when when they needed something and they they just they just managed that. So we didn't have to think about anything. Um, so, yeah, we've been very, very blessed. We probably don't tell them enough, actually, after this. I will be making sure I call both of them and um, yeah, thank them. Yes, big shout out to them all. Oh, thank yeah. you. And do you know, you've just said it right there. It's there's so many other implications of support or so many different types of support that are necessary. It's not just the emotional support or the physical support being there, but having that is just so vital. But things mm -hmm. like, yeah, you're right, the financial support as well, which can be devastating to people. You know, once you know, one minute you're working, the next you're not. And then to then look at the long term view and realize actually this is going to completely change you know that that whole thing is a is a very scary thing um mm. talking about support so that's kind of like your your little mini network of support i've got to bring it back to the encavalita society the support that they'd offer to you yeah. what what have they done for you how have they helped i absolutely love them <laughs> i'm trying to think of a more professional profound <laughs> way it took a I, in hindsight, I wish I'd have found them earlier, but I don't think I was massively ready in a way, if that makes sense. But since touching base with them, from the moment I've done that, I've spoken to John on the phone, just as a person sat in my car, like, oh gosh, I need to speak to somebody. They are there all the time and now like starting to volunteer for them. Um, they are just so wonderful and, they're just putting you in, like, I kind of feel like we're now just a bit more connected with other people that understand our life. Because, yes, our family are wonderful, but not one of them has got encephalitis. So, they, and they don't pretend to know, they don't. But when we do Zooms with other people, or I might do a carer Zoom, get so much out of it. Tom's come along to Zooms, and it's, it's, it sounds a bit cheesy but it just feels like this instant family that asks no question has no judgment and just says yeah here I am and it's totally that, that, hearing you say about the family that just makes me well up every single time because that, that's exactly how I feel about the encephalitis society and I think we there's not one person that doesn't say that mm. and it's such a beautiful incredible magical thing um to come out of such horror <laughs> yeah. to be honest you know the fact that we can feel that way with each other it, it is genuine and, it, and it's true and that that's a beautiful thing mm. and to be able to have that support you're right you know a tiny tiny small charity like the encephalitis society <laughs> to be able to offer that support you mentioned john john is one of our support workers there who is just a darling so big shout mm. out to john you've yeah saved many of us you really have yeah. <laughs> <laughs> along with the others you know I don't want to but you know we just we mentioned him but um so then you wanting to then be a volunteer what made you decide that I think I just from one conversation with John I just thought John's made such a difference to me and I like that idea and I just think I like the idea of educating people in what this is but I really like the idea of just being that listening ear that when someone feels like I did so lost so confused so well I'm gonna get emotional now I wasn't expecting that so it's fair to Tom's getting a bit emotional but actually I'm like, oh dear lord <laughs> oh if I can give a little bit of that back I want to give it and I want yeah. somebody else to know in the darkest, darkest moments, and they are dark, and it is absolutely terrifying. You are not alone. Yeah. And for me, just to be, if I can do that in any way, and I have met some people um, that have had encephalitis, and we've spoken, and just, you know, I don't have encephalitis. So when I speak to somebody who has, I, I feel really blessed that they that they're okay and they want to share a little bit I think it's kind of it's a it's it's huge and um yeah I just want to make a little bit of a difference yeah it's almost like you're a part of the club now <laughs> 
welcome. Good evening. <laughs> I mean, on, on that note, to like I say, be, and as you've said, there is absolute darkness, but with darkness, there also is, you know, mm -hmm. the light as well. So, you know, are you able to offer, you know, if, well, you put, pre, what would you say to somebody who is then, you know, newly diagnosed or to somebody, you know, a loved one who's just received that news? What words of encouragement could you offer to them? I just am a real big believer in, I'm a massive believer in time. Everything with time is clearer, it's easier. You process it a bit more. But I just think, allow yourself, Tom and I, it's all about patience. Just remind yourself that on those days, you know, just I just strip it right back. None of the things matter. What matters is Tom and I, our hearts are beating. We love each other. We have a wonderful friendship, a wonderful marriage, you know, that's based on a sense of humour and a bit silly. And it's just, however dark that is, just remember that you've got each other. Because for me and Tom, it was that simple. He literally could not have been here. So I would take this and that dark moment over the other alternative. So I am very much like, right, you can walk, you can do your breathing, just you know, it is frightening and it is scary, but allow yourself the time, allow yourself the emotions and really just try and connect and be together because it's frightening for all people involved, a mum, a son, a sister, an auntie, an uncle. So just, you know, and tell each other. We don't tell each other enough. I love you, Tom, but tell each other how you feel and, you know, be proud of one another and just try and get through the journey as much as you can together and, hope at the end it's all all right Aww. I don't think that's good advice I'm not quite sure I got a bit blabbly then sorry no that brilliant brilliant advice and I think that because time is something that I think we all forget that we need to be patient with you know you can't mm. rush time time follows its own form doesn't yeah, it you know absolutely. so just and that's just such a brilliant reminder and also just you clearly have got such great open communication with each other so I think I'd also like to add that as well is to mm -hmm. just keep on talking to each other and keep on talking to other people um because even for my if I can bring it to myself sorry to make it sound so selfish but just because I too have been there but mm. I was back in 2006. So even many years, you know, I mean, I, 2012 is still what, 10 years. So it's still, yeah. a, you know, it's a significant amount of time, but even still, no matter how, what I'm trying to say, I'm also waffling apologies, but I suppose what I'm trying to say is no matter how long it's been since the diagnosis, always check in, always yeah. give yourself time and yeah, keep those right. lines of communication open mm. because to be honest, I'm even finding just doing these conversations is raising things within me that I hadn't even mm. considered. Um, so I've already, you know, got a few talks to be scheduled in with my loved ones. I just want to, you know, just to check in with them and just, yeah. you know, just to, because there's things that, I mean, I don't know whether maybe Tom, you, you feel this way as well, but there's, there's, you can change your mind on how you feel about certain things. You know, certain days you could, well, it's probably the same for you as well, Tony. Certain days you can be absolutely frustrated with the entire world. It does not matter what is going on. You've just woken up that day and it's just one of those days. It's just how it's going to be. But then another day you've got the same exact challenges facing you, but you can deal with them that day. And there is no rhyme or reason to it. And I think, again, it probably feeds back in nicely to what you were saying there about the time. If you just remind yourself about the time, mm. just take time, then you can just accept, I think, you know, whatever it is that is being presented to you that day. And then, yeah, time, take things day by day, you know, yeah, don't push yeah, yourself absolutely. too much and don't, don't be too hard on yourself. Mm. But um, thank you. And I really appreciate you, you opening up with that. That's amazing. You also mentioned just about how you have silly little jokes and your humour with each other. Are you able to give us a little insight into that? So I like to play pranks on Tom because I have an evil sense of humour and Tom reacts <laughs> amazingly. If he didn't react, it would be so fine and I'd get bored. But he does make me laugh so much and that's what we do we laugh a lot so in hospital I painted his nails Christmas nails so all the consultants thought it was amazing he had a penguin which you actually quite liked um 
we've got pictures of us um, when Tom is going through chemo treatment and I've got like chocolate buttons as eyes. So I just like put them in and then do, you know, and talk, oh God, here we go again. So we do things like that. Tom is also incredibly funny. So when he relaxes, he just has me crying with like his little one-liners. And, you know, we just kind of have a bit of banter, a bit of silliness. Yesterday in the supermarket, I hid around an aisle and jumped out on him. <laughs> <laughs> That one didn't make him jump. He just laughed and then pretended that he didn't know me and carried on walking along. Um, but yeah, we just do, we're just a bit silly. We just like to be a bit silly because life hasn't always been silly and it doesn't always allow you to be silly. So, you know, yesterday we had squirty cream and we had my niece and nephew around and we were squirting the cream in their mouth and they had to sing a song or do something ridiculous. And we just like to, you know, it's good for Avery and Erin because there's lots of rules and there's lots of organisation and things have to be a certain way, you know, to make life a little bit easier for Tom. So we just bring it with the silliness when we can. That's actually a really, really good point as well, because I think because I guess there's so much structure and things have to be kind of like in a very set way. Yeah. So, yeah, that 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 element of fun for the kids must just be absolute mm. pure joy. <laughs> Although our youngest does it now to our eldest. So our oh. youngest jumps the eldest. And again, the eldest responds like Tom and tells her off and gets very cross about and isn't happy. And the youngest finds it so funny. She just keeps doing it. So now we're having to say, can you stop jumping your sister, please? Um, so yeah, I think the youngest is definitely incredibly cheeky and silly. So she she brings a lot of the jokes and pranks as well, doesn't yeah. she? So yeah. Absolutely. Brilliant. Brilliant. I love it. I think that's great. I think everyone should do more of that. Jumping out in each other at the aisles. Can you imagine? Yeah. Be... <laughs> we'll get a few funny looks when we're in the supermarket. That's and for sure. Tom loves it if you're in the supermarket and he's ahead and you start shouting things at him. So they might just be like silly things. And then I suppose the question I've been asking everybody just to kind of like wrap up as well is I use music as a form of therapy and I find it very just it's just a part of my DNA so there's certain songs that I will listen to if I need a certain kind of like pick me up or mm -hmm. even if I'm feeling a little bit down you know sometimes you need to wallow in that kind of misery without that sounding mm. too depressing but you know you have to acknowledge like I said earlier acknowledge those down days as well as the up days um do either of you do something similar do you have certain songs or music or is it yeah. art or painting yeah. It's music all the time. So from the yeah, moment we wake up, music. and yes, yes. I've always said to them, the one thing I really want the children to remember is that round dinner times and happy home times, there's always the music's on. My parents were dancing in the kitchen. So we're always dancing in the kitchen. We are always playing songs. They've got their little Googles now, so they request their own songs. I go through phases. So if I'm feeling a bit lovey, then I play um, the tightrope song from The Greatest Showman. Oh. And I play that to Tom. And yeah. I say, Tom, that's my song to you. Yeah. We have complete different music tastes. So we, you know, it's always a bit, I'm very cheesy pop and Tom's a bit more <laughs> poor wet. Tom's very cool and he's always been a bit cool. And I'm like just a rage and take that fan. Um, <laughs> 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 But for me, it's probably that. That's the one I like to sing to you, and I put that on. And then I just like anything upbeat, gets you a bit skippy, and off you go. And again, anything you can be a bit sort of singing to. But Tom's got an amazing voice, so he sings all sorts of things, don't Ooh. you? I'm not singing now. No, no. <laughs> we'll save that for another time, Tom, another time. <laughs> oh, dear. Who about you? Do you have you have like a lot of things, right? You don't. I, I just like a bit of Paul Weller and things like that. All the bit older, old, older stuff. Modern yeah. rock. Yeah, yeah, very yeah. Old, old rock. Mm. Sort of yeah, thing. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. And then just to just to end it, is there anything that? We've not discussed or anything that you'd like to say to anybody out there listening. Um, you know, yeah, anything that you'd like to, to end this with? Um, if I'm really honest, Lucy, we just want to thank you because yeah. we oh. um, really appreciate you kind of getting, like, doing the podcast with us. We've never done anything like that before. And actually, we've been talking about you all week. So 
you know, just how lovely you are. And you've just made the whole process. This is so new, especially for Tom. And um, it's just really lovely for how kind you've been and generous with your time and what you're doing to raise awareness. So we are massively sending out huge appreciation for you. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll end it there because I'm about to go off and cry. Thank you so much. That honestly, those are such kind words and it means everything to me. And it's it's not about me. I'll take that. But really, it's about you. It's about everybody else's experiences. I'm wanting to put this together just to show people it's about creating awareness. It's World Encephalitis Day. We've got a special day that we want to let the world know because it's a global condition you know it doesn't yeah. discriminate and it's just about letting as many people out there know about encephalitis mm. it is a devastating illness it does change lives and you have so bravely and honestly shared your experiences with us today and like I say you've taught me things I didn't even know about this form of encephalitis um you know just the adjustments that you've had to make in your life how you're dealing with it the attitude the joy the fun you bring to just deal with it I am in absolute awe of you two as well so back at you thank you both so 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 much and I just wish you all the very best so thank you thank you thank you thank you bye-bye You have been listening to The Day My Brain Broke. If you would like further information about the Encephalitis Society, their website is encephalitis.info. That's E-N-C-E-P-H-A-L-I-T-I-S dot info. You can also find them on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and LinkedIn. Also, if you have been or know of someone else who has been affected by encephalitis and you would like to share your story, please do get in contact with us as we would love to hear from you. You can email me at lucy.teamencephalitis at gmail.com. And finally, if you're also inclined to see more of what I have to offer, then please do like and subscribe to my YouTube channel, Ladybird Wellness. You can also find Ladybird Wellness on Facebook and Instagram.